Dr. Dedone, I've got to say thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so interested in learning about your background and where you started working with the Deanna Protocol and how this story really came out of your own story, really. I mean, it's your own daughter is Deanna. Um, but how you've transitioned from a career of orthopedic surgery into what you thought was going to be a nice retirement um, and then turned into coming out of retirement because you became this researcher and now you've become this incredible expert in neurodegenerative diseases. And again, thank you for being here, but I can give a little bit about your background, but I want you to tell me your background specifically because it's more than I could even get, you know, a mouthful of words to explain. So what was your background as an MD prior to all of this? Okay. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you for having me here and asking me these questions to get the story out. Um, I graduated from medical school, University of Padua in Italy in 1963. I came back to the United States and did an internship at Methodist Hospital in Brooklyn. And then I did a surgical residency and orthopedic residency, total of four years at Lenox Hill Hospital in New York City, um, which was a very interesting um, venue because we took care of the New York Rangers, the New York Yankees, and, um, and the New York Jets. So uh, had a strong background in sports medicine. Before sports medicine was really on the, you know, uh, on the horizon. Um, I finished my residency and was uh, brought up to the Air Force during the Vietnam War. Um, they stationed me at McDill Air Force Base as the chief of orthopedics. And McDill Air Force Base in Tampa, Florida was the venue where all um, airmen who were wounded during Vietnam and lived in the southeastern United States, they came to McDill because it would be close to their homes and their family. And I had a very active practice there. And in fact, uh, one of the interesting things is had a lot of airmen who had fractured long bones, tibias, femurs, humeruses. And I brought back from Germany a method of treating long bone fractures using a Kunchner nail, which I introduced into the United States. And that's an interesting story because the Germans developed this method because during World War II, their pilots would get shot down, bail out of the plane, and when they hit the ground, a lot of them would fracture a femur or a tibia. And so they had to get these pilots back up in the air right away. So they put these metal rods down into the bones. And uh, in two weeks, when the wound was healed, put them back into the air. And when we captured them, we said this was inhumane. <laughs> but actually, it was an excellent method of treating these fractures. So <clears throat> when I completed my uh, term in the Air Force, I opened up a private practice in North Tampa, up near the University of South Florida. I did general orthopedics. And then in 1978, I introduced arthroscopic surgery for knees and, and shoulders to the southeastern United States. Um, and I also, in 1980, opened an ambulatory surgery center because we could treat diseases of so much cheaper than in the hospital. If I was doing a meniscectomy on a 20-year-old kid in the hospital, the facility fee would be 20 grand. We could do it for five grand as an outpatient. And I became the team physician for the University of South Florida, and a clinical professor of orthopedics at the University of South Florida. Um, I retired, I was chief of orthopedics at University Community Hospital, which is now Florida Hospital in the Advent System. I retired in 1997. My wife and I um, traveled extensively for 10 years. 
Um, in 2007, my daughter Deanna complained of stumbling every time she walked. And she noticed that uh, she saw me coming down a flight of stairs. And she said, Dad, you came down those stairs. You didn't even look at the stairs. And I said, Deanna, you don't look at the stairs. She didn't realize that she had to look at the stairs so that she wouldn't lose her balance. I checked her reflexes and they were abnormal. Um, she was an attorney at the time and had just made partner in a local law firm. And one of the things that would happen that really scared me was if she would stumble, she would fall, but she lost the reflex ability to put her hands out to block the fall. So she would hit her head. So all of this was prior, we're here talking about Deanna, all of this is prior to Deanna's diagnosis of ALS. Yes. So these are just the early signs of the early symptomatic uh, observations that were taking place, but no yeah. one knew what, what it was at the time. Exactly. So um, we started to bring her around to physicians and a friend of mine, a neurologist in Tampa, um, did an EMG study on her. And the test, which basically shows action potentials in muscles, was very indicative of ALS. Mm. And he didn't really want to make that diagnosis. And so we went to Johns Hopkins. Yes, she has ALS. We went to the Mayo Clinic. Yes, she has ALS. And uh, they gave her two to five years to live. Go home, uh, get your affairs in order. And so, so I have to interrupt you and ask this question. So here you are, an established physician who retired from being the head of orthopedics at, a, at the hospital. You've worked with all these famous athletes. You've worked with all of these things. And now here you are as a father hearing a diagnosis of your own daughter. I mean, you've got these superpowers in the medical field with all these other people in the world, and now you've got a diagnosis of your daughter, which is something that you had no experience in. I have to imagine that just felt like such a helpless feeling because here you are, this master of medicine, and now it hits home. Yeah, well, it was. It was daunting. And um, <clears throat> it was just something that it was almost impossible for me to accept. I had one experience with, an AL, with ALS, and it happened to be just an observational experience where I saw a woman taking out of a wheelchair and put into a chair that extended out from the car and just watched her total inability to move. And then the chair picked her up and went in the car. And I said to myself, can you imagine? You still have a brain, you can still think, but your body doesn't function. Mm. You can't hold anything, you can't walk. You can't even sit up straight. Being flashbacks of this moment when you hear that your daughter now has ALS. Absolutely. You're, you're thinking back to this woman you saw completely debilitated in a van one day. And I'm saying, is this going to be my daughter? Mm -hmm. And uh, Deanna and I discussed it. And she says, Dad, I don't want to die. And I said, I don't want you to die. I said, look. If you'll be the test case, I'll do everything I can to research neurodegenerative diseases and see if I can find something that would work in helping you. She said, fine. So this was the covenant. And indeed, almost for two years, I injected her with substances. She took oral substances, intravenous substances, and... Uh, to see if there was anything that might help her. During this period of time, her disease was progressing. 
I think it was about 2011 when I came across this product, alpha ketoglutaric acid, which when I gave it to her, um, she said, Dad, I can carry a glass of water without spilling it now. And patients who have ALS have incessant muscle symptoms, twitching, fasciculations, so they're very uncomfortable. And the AKG suppressed those symptoms. She also had severe muscle cramps. And I spoke to her doctor at Johns Hopkins, and he said, you can use gabapentin. I researched gabapentin. I saw it was GABA, GABA aminobutyric acid, which is the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter. And we put her on that. It was not supposed to be able to pass the blood-brain barrier, but she started taking it. She no longer had the cramps. Yeah. I want to add, this is four years later. This yes. is 2007 as a diagnosis, and you started work immediately, which is probably one of the most amazing parts I hear of the story, because being familiar with the story, the she received the diagnosis, and you didn't wait a year. You didn't wait two years. You didn't, you know, do the. You jumped into action, you know, like a heroic father would. But you you jumped into action to start doing this. But it wasn't for four years that you really came across what started working. So, two to five year diagnosis, you know, that's her. That's her. You said you used the words "go home and get your affairs in order." Yes. She has two to five years to live. You started doing all of these things, desperately searching for something that would have an impact. And I would, I would argue and say something was having an impact because she stayed alive all the way through 2011 when you came across some of these things. So her condition, she continued to generate. She continued to have cell, cellular death. She continued to you know, become more symptomatic and more symptomatic as time played out. But four years, she was a patient zero to your research. That, that that time had to seem like an eternity. Well, you know, it did. And um, once we started the Diana protocol, which was the combination of AKG and GABA, and let me just say, that's the core Diana protocol. But alpha ketoglutaric acid is a, um, it's a bi-acid bipolar acid. It's very strong. And we look for something to neutralize it. And arginine is a bipolar base. And so arginine neutralized it. Plus there was an added benefit to arginine, which was basically it increased uh, energy production in the mitochondria. Um, it also lowered blood sugar and caused vasodilation which increased blood supply. So the Diana protocol was developed AAKG and GABA. And we started her on that. And I began, I said, this is working for my daughter. Her cognition was improved, her muscle symptoms were suppressed, and the speed with which the disease was progressing was slowed down. And so that was 2011. We had a lot of patients who reported that it helped them also. They stated, you know, I can swallow. I couldn't swallow before. And I don't have the muscle symptoms. Some might say, well, it didn't really help the muscle symptoms. And I would tell them, OK. Stop taking it for a few weeks, and let me know how you do. So I want to add in there, you used the word, we had a lot of patients, but you weren't treating anybody. No. But my understanding is that because people knew Deanna, and they knew her, her situation, and you'd been networking in this ALS community so deeply, that people saw what was happening with her, and they started asking you questions, and what is she doing, and what therapeutics are you using on her, and you started sharing this formula... With, exactly, exactly. With people. So you weren't treating patients per se, but you were actually 
having other people experiment with it and collecting and anecdotal exactly, support. Exactly, exactly. I was not treating patients. In fact, <clears throat> the desire to get this word out, my family um, basically started a 501c3 not-for-profit corporation, um, winningthefight.org. The acronym is WFND, Winning the Fight Against Neurodegenerative Diseases. And this was to go online and have a site that we could direct people to and tell them the story about Tiana. And uh, what happened was and I tried to promote this to uh, neurologists. And they said, well, this is just anecdotal evidence, and we can't accept it. So then we decided to fund a research project at the University of South Florida. And we funded that project on ALS mice. That is, mice that were engineered mutationally to have ALS. And what we found was, and nothing, no other, no, no other product had ever touched these mice or helped them. It slowed the disease progression, improved their muscle function, and improved their energy production because they did metabolic, metabolomic studies on the mice, which basically show what are the products the catabolic products, breakdown products of energy production. And the mice that were on the DP, it was increased. Well, the people in academia, the neurologists said to me, you can't transfer mice studies to humans. I said, all right. So to get the word out, we wrote the book, The Deanna Protocol, Hope for ALS, and other neurodegenerative diseases. In the book, in the appendix, we document 40 patients who had ALS who took the Deanna protocol. There is a functional rating scale, ALS, FRS. And usually ALS patients, their function will diminish by 1.5 to two points a month. Over a six-month period, the patients that took the DP diminished by one or less a month. Those graphs are documented in the appendix of the book. It was published in 2015. Once again, in touch with neurologists at the universities, they asked me the question, well, first they said, well, we understand that you're not in this to make money. I said, no. And they asked me the question, well, who tested them and wrote down their functional rating scores? I said, the patients. They said, well, you need to have the neurologist do that. Well, I said, if the neurologist won't prescribe the DP, they're not going to do the functional rating scoring. And by the way, the neurologists have the patients score themselves. Okay. So we weren't getting through. And um, I actually offered to fund clinical trials on the DP at Mass General, University of South Florida, and the Bird Neurodegenerative Center. It was turned down in all three places. Then I found out that at the University of Central Florida, they had a program of nanotechnology. And what they do is they can take a cell from someone who has a neurodegenerative disease, like ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or Alzheimer's disease, they can take that cell from the patient, take blood or a skin cell. In vitro, in the laboratory, they can downregulate that cell to a stem cell. It's called an induced pluripotent stem cell, a very immature cell. 
then they can apply nerve growth factors and make that cell a nerve cell. Well, lo and behold, that cell has the pathology for ALS, Alzheimer's disease, and the other neurodegenerative diseases. Mm. So they looked at the ALS nerve cell, and what did they see? Well, they looked and saw the nerve cell. Then they saw the axon, which is the extension from the nerve cell, to a synapse that connects to another nerve cell or through a neuromuscular junction to connect to a muscle. And they saw in that axon the conduits that carry the signal to the other nerve cell or muscle. They're microtubules. They saw the microtubules develop swelling or varicosities. They also saw that the electrophysiological signaling was flat. When they added the DP, the swelling diminished, the electrophysiological signaling reappeared. In both ALS, no matter what gene mutation they used, okay, and not published yet, that study is published, it's a plus one published study. Alzheimer's disease, the same thing, plus that there was amyloid deposits in the extracellular space, and when the DP was added, these deposits were diminished. So I, I want to get further into the science of you know, amyloid deposits and, and the microtubules that leave, and we're going to get into to tau energy and, and these types of things. But I want to take one quick step back with you and say, back to Deanna, 2007, she receives a diagnosis, and then you said that in 2015, you finally had gotten what you believed was the right balance of formula, the Deanna protocol, or as you call it, the DP. Well, we documented what was happening in the laboratory, which we knew was happening clinically. Uh, understood, but I want to get to the point that she continued to degenerate, though, even up through that, that period. Yes, so, at a slower rate. Correct. So at a slower weight, it was able to arrest some of the symptoms from developing, and at a slower rate, her, her condition... Instead of dying within two to five years, she was still living. And then there was a point that you discovered that there might have been another underlying problem that is normal with people with ALS or other types of neurodegenerative diseases, um, and it involved a lab called Igenix, I believe. Can you, can you fill me in on what happened there? Well, my contact with other physicians on the internet. This one very erudite physician said that neurodegenerative diseases, in specific ALS, is caused by a bacterial infection. The infection is Borrelia. Now, my knowledge of infectious diseases is minuscule as an orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> so I had to start studying infectious diseases. So for years you've gone from orthopedics into neurological disorders and now you're becoming an infectious disease <laughs> expert also. Exactly, exactly. I wouldn't say expert, but I knowledge about this specific type of infection. Now understand that every ALS patient, when the diagnosis is made, is tested for Lyme disease, and Lyme disease is caused by Borrelia. Uh, and they're tested according to the CDC criteria. And every test is negative, because the tests are done at commercial laboratories. And commercial laboratories don't have the antigens capable of detecting the antibodies of the Borrelia bacteria. So this erudite friend of mine said, you have to have it tested at Igenix. And we had it tested at Igenix. Um, and in 2015, we got the results back that she had a Borrelia infection. I still wasn't convinced. ALS has been around for since 1939, Lou Gehrig, 
billions of dollars have been spent on research to find the cause of it. Right, and now you're sitting here with a solution. And now I'm sitting here with a solution that it's an infectious disease. I was skeptical. But in October of 2015, my daughter developed spinal meningitis, severe. She couldn't put her chin to her chest without severe pain. We admitted her to the hospital. Discussion with the infectious disease expert. All the tests done at the hospital, MRI, CAT scan, cerebral spinal fluid, laboratory tests for bacteria, white blood cells, all the tests were negative. Oh, I'm talking to the infectious disease doc and she's saying all the tests are negative. I said, yeah, my daughter is dying. I said, look, I have an outside laboratory that we tested her and they tested positive for Borrelia. Let's put her on IV antibiotics. What have we got to lose? So the ID doc agreed with me. We put her on um, strong antibiotic, Rocephin, two grams every 24 hours. Her pain went away. She can now put her chin to her chest. She can lift her leg up. However, as the time elapsed from the dose, the pain started to come back. So we increased the dose to every 12 hours. Well, she has not had that pain since 2015. That's so astounding. And, you know, we, based on that, we developed, myself and some other doctors, because these patients have to be placed on large doses of antibiotics. And the antibiotics no, not only kill the pathogens, they kill the normal commensal or symbiotic bacteria. So we did a pulsed method. We put them on large doses, high doses of antibiotics for three days and we'd put them on probiotics and prebiotics for seven days. So we'd kill everything and only replace good bacteria. And the lesson that I learned from the fact that my daughter went from 2007 to 2015, where cells continued to degenerate, losing function, was what if we had known back in 2009 or 2007 that the cause was a bacterial infection and started the treatment then, she would not have lost all this function. So while you're treating the patient, it takes time to kill off the bacteria. So you're losing cells, you're losing function. Therefore, it's important to take the Deanna protocol at that time and during that period. Because what does it do? It makes the patient more comfortable, slows the progression of the disease, so you retain more function. and in the end, if you lose that cell that controls that certain function, you don't know if you can get that function back. So if I'm hearing you correctly, we have a, a two-prong approach here to dealing with this, and that is through your learnings and, and study. There's first, obviously, this Deanna protocol, the, the combination of things that you've put together in this, this formula is it's not curing ALS, but it, it's, it's managing symptoms, really. Keeping the, cells alive. Right. The, the Deanna protocol is keeping it alive. It's, it's, it's arresting some of the continued degeneration. But this other prong is that there is this bacterial issue that most people with ALS need to get treated for. But unfortunately, it doesn't even show up on most 
you know, lab tests. Most that, common lab tests at commercial laboratories. Right. So at a commercial lab, it's, it's just not specific enough to look for something like this, and that's why you, the use of iGenics has been useful for you when you're talking to people who are suffering this way. So our, our recommendation, of course, would be if you're dealing with a person who's received an ALS or, for that matter, some other kind of neurological diagnosis, get tested. Get, get tested fast. At a specialty laboratory. At a specialty lab. And again, Igenix and that information is available on the Deanna Protocol website, I believe. And then, you know, the other thing is take the Deanna Protocol in the meanwhile, because this is keeping the, the cells alive while you fight the underlying issue. Oh, that correct. You've got an invader in the body, so we need to keep the lights on, <laughs> but we also need to fight the enemy that's already behind the gates. And, and that becomes kind of that two-pronged battle that needs to handle. One of the things I heard you say earlier in a conversation I had with you was that a lot of people want to take the Deanna protocol because that seems to be the easy thing to do, but they neglect the other side of it, which is this dealing with the Borrelia infection, that they want to deal with one and they don't deal with the other. Is that even effective? Ultimately, they're going to die. And what we're trying to do is save their lives. And the longer they wait, to deal with the infection, the more function they're going to lose, and the worse off their life is going to be. Right. There, there is another aspect to this. Is you might ask, well, how does somebody get a Borrelia infection? Or how does somebody get Lyme disease, which is a Borrelia infection? The best example I have is my daughter. She went to Peru, Machu Picchu, in 2004. And she came back, and she was sick for a month. Uh, you know, not traveler's sickness, the diarrhea. I'm talking about fatigue, fog, brain fog, that kind of sickness. And her husband had frequent upper respiratory infections. He was a young, healthy guy. And in putting the pieces together, after they got married, they moved into a house, which right after Katrina, the house was totally renovated. And right after Katrina, we ran out of American drywall. So they got drywall from China. The drywall from China has a lot of toxins because it's mined. It's not gathered from a smelter in a cold uh, factory or whatever. And, and then the dust is cleaned. It's mined. And a lot of uh, toxins in that mine drywall. In fact, when you would walk into our house, there would sort of be a metallic type of odor. And all the copper fixtures and the back of the mirror turned black. Interesting. So it was very high in hydrogen sulfide. So my daughter lived in that house for 27 months. And what I opine is, she was infected with the Borrelia in Peru. Her immune system suppressed it. But then she lived in the house with all the toxins that suppressed her immune system. The Borrelia was able to flourish, kill cells, and her neurological condition became in 2007, 2000, probably before 2007, okay, became obvious. So in 2007, it became a functional issue. It started exactly. to present, but it could have been minor even before that. It certainly, you had to have a certain number of cells killed to lose the function. Right. So my question, in hearing all of that, is so she goes to Peru, she comes back, she's living in a, in a home that's got toxins and whatnot in it, which later was discovered. What I'm taking away from that, Dr. Tadone, and correct me if I'm wrong, is you don't know when you're going to be exposed to something that could cause this. That, you know, who a lot of people go to Peru and don't come back with ALS. A lot of people have lived in homes with 
you know, toxic drywall and never come up with ALS. And it could be any number of things. I mean, we hear about Lyme disease being the result of tick bites and, and those types of things. Um, it, it's almost as if it doesn't matter what the circumstances were prior. You need tested. The problem is we don't have very good tests. And the, the reason why is the Borrelia bacteria, the spirochete, when it's in your body for a period of time, it moves out of circulation and it moves into soft tissue, into ligaments and tendons. And then it'll form a cyst when there's an ambient it doesn't like. So you're not getting antibodies against that antigen, so it's not detectable. Right, for an antibody test, for sure. And so what this other doctor determined is what we have to do is we have to treat the cyst to open it up. So you put the patient on a metronidazole, which is Flagyl or Tindamax, at the same time that they're on the IV antibiotics. Or oral antibiotics, if we're talking about a slower progressing disease. But we can get into that. And that opens up the cysts. Okay, and now the antibodies can detect the antigen, and the um, what, what happens is the antibiotics kill the uncysted bacteria. The DNA is then picked up in circulation, and now we can test for it. So I'm going to try to translate that to the layperson. It's the equivalent of needing to pull the scab off so that you can actually get to the infection beneath it. We call it the pretest. Mm -hmm. And actually what we do is we advise people to take a pretest for 28 days, oral ceftin or zithromax, and oral tindamax or flagyl. And that at the end of that period, all right, then get tested at Igenix. Now, let me say, if you have ALS, uh, okay, I, I think you should go to Igenix as soon as you can and not wait a month or so forth. Um, chances are, if your symptoms, if you have those kinds of symptoms, you're going to be able to detect the antibodies. I would start the Deanna protocol immediately okay I left something out and what are the vectors for these bacteria and it's not only Borrelia but there's also Bartonella, Babesia, Ehrlichii, perhaps fungi, perhaps protozoa you don't know what the vector has and the vector is not just a tick it could be a horsefly could be a mosquito, could be lice, could be a sand flea. We don't know what all the vectors are. It's also transmitted, Borrelia is, and probably the others, sexually. And so it's transplacental also. Mm. So when you look at familial ALS, and so you say, you got the mutated gene from the mother or the parent. Did you get the mutated gene or did you get the Borrelia, which then caused the gene mutation? Right. We just don't if, know. If you treat, I had a patient who I was mentoring his treatment. It's an interesting case. When I was in the Air Force, I got a fighter pilot that came to me at McDill. And he had been in an F-4 jet. It was in a power dive over England. He couldn't pull out. He ejected. 
he flailed all four extremities. He came to me in a body cast. Well, I did an IM, intermedullary nailing of his humerus, intermedullary nailing of his femur, intermedullary nailing of his tibia. After my first operation, he was German-French, okay. <laughs> Actually, he was born in an air raid shelter in Germany in 1945. His wife said to me, will he ever be able to ski again? I said, God, I hope he can walk again. Why is that pertinent? About 20 years later, I get a call from him. First of all, he tells me he went back on active duty. He was retired from the Air Force. He was now running a faith family clinic in Massachusetts. The rod I put in his humerus was working its way out, so it was impinging on his shoulder movement. And so the doctor who took it out wanted to know what I used so he would have the right instruments there to remove it. So I told him he had the rod removed. And so Christian came to see me. He met Deanna. He knew my story with ALS. Lo and behold, about four years ago, he has ALS. Wow. So he's totally on board with me mentoring his treatment. His neurologist is on board too. And we're treating him with the Deanna protocol, pulsed antibiotic method, and there's another herbal treatment method which I haven't gotten into yet, but I will. And he's doing great. His scores are all one or less, his functional rating scores. All of a sudden, he starts to get worse. Mm. Well, we test his wife. His wife was positive for Borrelia, Bartonella, and Babesia. They had been intimate. He was reinfected. And then two months later, he died. Oh, wow. So you have to treat the partner. Interesting. That I did not know anything about. Because it's transsexual. It's, it's sexually transmitted. So talk to me. We've had conversation about what you keep referring to as tau. Well, tau is a protein whose function is necessary to maintain the integrity of the microtubules that carry signals between nerve cell and nerve cell and nerve cell and muscle. There's research at the University of Cambridge. Every neurodegenerative disease has abnormal tau. It's called a tauopathy. We're talking about ALS, Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, myalgic encephalitis, and there are others out there that are less known. They're all abnormal tau. And so when you see microtubules that are not maintained and they have a flat line for electrophysiological signal and you add the Deanna protocol and the microtubules become straight, no longer swollen, and the electrophysiological signal is reestablished, you've basically corrected for the function of tau. That's fantastic. And the, and the purpose behind tau, which you said is a protein, is... And, right. And, and how do you get abnormal tau? Okay. This is what I opine. Today, in research, all the research is on abnormal products produced by the cell. Abnormal proteins, tau. There's also ubiquitin, TDP-43, others. There's also abnormal enzymes, 
There were also gene mutations. When I started with ALS, there was one gene mutation. Now we have 22. Instead of focusing on correcting for the abnormal proteins, and we can add amyloid into that. Billions of dollars have been spent to get rid of amyloid because it's the cause, it's not the cause. Amyloid is the body's process of shutting down an inflammatory uh, inflammation in the body, in the brain in specific. An amyloid buildup is in essence what we call plaque, correct? That's amyloid plaque, beta amyloid plaque. And th there are studies by a pathologist, Alan McDonald, who has documented this presence of the spirochete in the amyloid. And let, let me tell you why. Well, I want to connect a dot there because you just said something that was really interesting that I don't know if everybody else would have picked up, and that is you're talking about the spirochete, which is actually a part of the bacteria. It's the Borrelia. So the Borrelia, which is actually what's deriving or what's creating that spirochete, is being found in the amyloid plaque that's being built up, which means that there's a direct causation, not just correlation, but there's Correct. a causation taking place between this bacteria and then the amyloid plaque buildup, which is most common in Alzheimer's. It's common in all neurodegenerative diseases. It's common in chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Mm. Football players have concussions and sub-concussions. Not all of them, but some of them develop chronic traumatic encephalopathy, and at autopsy, they all have amyloid plaque. I don't know if you saw the movie Concussion, mm -hmm. and the doctor's name is Amalau, and, and he documented the presence. All right. Another doctor, Hungarian, Judith Miklosi, M-I-K-L-O-S-S-Y, she has also documented the presence of the spirochete in Alzheimer's disease mm. in the plaque. We need to understand that the body is an amazing, amazing organism. That the immune system is there to protect the body. I take great issue with the term autoimmune disease. I don't believe autoimmune diseases exist. It's just that medicine is not capable of detecting the cause of the autoimmune disease, okay. That's now, a big statement. Yes, yes. And I'm not the only one that believes that, all right. This magnificent organism, the human body, why would it attack itself? Ask that question. Now, in my studies, I studied a pathologist, German pathologist by the name of Erkow, who delineated the inflammatory process. And the last step of the inflammatory process is the body shuts it down. If you're in bone, all right, if the infection is in bone, the body lays calcium around the infection and walls it off. Now I'll tell you a story. In the 60s, when I was covering an emergency room in New York City, I had a patient who was in his 40s. He was running to catch a train. He struck his thigh bone, his femur, on the turnstile. His thigh began to swell, pain. Came into the emergency room, we x-rayed him. What did we see? We saw an area of calcification, dense white. In the middle was a radiolucent speck, okay? And coming out of that radiolucent area was a tiny crack. Delving into his history, when he was four years old, so he's 40 now, so 40 from the 60s brings us into the 20s. He had osteomyelitis, bone infection. I don't know what they used to treat him, but they treated him. 
the body walled the infection off. But the infection still existed, and his the infection was released it. totally circumscribed. Okay, and that was the end of it. And this is what Verk calls it: the body shuts the inflammation down. Now, in the brain, the body uses amyloid. What are amyloid? They're mucopolysaccharides that the body deposits outside the cell. You want to stop the spirochete and stop the inflammation. Protect itself. Now, interesting, when we use the DP and the cell is brought back, it probably, I opine, takes products from amyloid that it needs to produce normal substances. That's interesting. Because why would the amyloid disappear? You're yeah. in a you're in it's a cell. A waste product. You're in a petri cell. Well, it's not a waste. Well, a waste product. It's a product that the body produces and obviously needs, and now it's refunctioning because it has the DP, okay. And so it must want to absorb those. It needs those products. So to answer this for me, the amyloid levels are actually increasing in the body, which is like a plaque, so a buildup, a residue, if you will, that takes place in the area that's inflamed, albeit we're talking the brain right now. When the, the, the combination of, of ingredients that are in the Deanna protocol are introduced into the body and the cell actually starts getting that neurological energy that it's been deprived of for so long, it comes alive. But then after a period of time, you're saying that we're noticing the decrease in amyloid production, plaque, plaque formation. But, but not just the reduction in its production. We're actually noticing decreased levels. Absolutely. Of and there's no circulation there. So there's nothing. Right. It's not like it's getting washed away. It, it's just the cell. Correct. So the cell must be taking it back in to utilize those products those substances to make the products it needs to make. So the amyloid productions, in essence, are working in, in harmony with the Deanna protocol that you're actually, you know, again, you opine, that this is actually helping feed the cell again, that the cell is almost using what I'll refer to as the waste product or the plaque buildup exactly. to refeed itself as it regenerates this energy. Why else would it be gone? It's interesting, but yeah, because if the if the if the amyloid levels are decreased, where are they going? Because there's no circulation in the brain. Exactly. So it's not as if it's flushing. And this is the outside the cell. Right. It's extracellular the amyloid. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. All in an effort to decrease that inflammation. Way back when, was reading a research paper by this guy Vivian Teichberg, who's passed away. He was at the Weizmann Institute. And he did research on glioblastoma multiform. By the way, that's caused by Borrelia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he did it on rats. And what he found was that when the cells lost energy, the membrane potential changed. So glutamate Glutamate is the primary excitatory neurotransmitter. It's primarily found in the axon. It exits the cell. Glutamate does. Extracellular glutamate in relation to intracellular. Intracellular is 10,000 to 1. When the glutamate exits the cell, it actually kills contiguous cells. Think of stroke. Yep. What are the breakdown products of glutamate? AKG and GABA. So when glutamate exits the cell, it can't be metabolized. What does the cell lack? AKG and GABA. Interesting. How would you stop the glutamate from exiting the cell, or does that just always happen? Well, what you have to do is increase the energy so it reestablishes the permeability of the cell membrane. Oh, so you're referring that the cell membrane thins, and that's how the glutamate ends up leaving the cell. In fact, there is some research that says what the brillia really does is it affects the cell membrane. That's neither here nor there. Okay, the effect is the same. The other point is, 
this will interest you. Richard, Gre Richard, Richard Feech is an MD, PhD at the National Institute of Health. He passed away. He studied under Hans Krebs, the Krebs cycle. Mm -hmm. So I was talking to him. And way back in 1980, he did research on ALS mice. And he used ketone bodies, which are beta hydroxybutyrate and, alpha and uh, acetoacetate. And he found that he was able to slow the degeneration down. So I said, Richard, you know, AKG is a ketone. Why did you use those two ketones? He said, well, the polarity of AKG doesn't allow it to enter normal cells. And, and I said, but if the cell is degenerating, would AKG enter the cell? He said, yes, that was an aha moment. How many treatments do you have where they're not wasted on norm, right, they they're just the targeting the cells that yeah. need it, and AKG just targets the cells in the process of degeneration? That's incredible, actually. Yeah, I mean, the treatment normally is systemic. How interesting to have something that only affects the damaged cells. It's membrane, the membrane polarity, and the polarity of AKG repels it in a normal cell. Interesting. And does that get affected by the, uh, you talk about the polarity of the AKG, does that get affected by the polarity or the, the non-polarity, if you will, of the arginine? Well, the bottom line is it's all in solution. When you put AAKG in solution, it breaks down to arginine and AKG. Mm -hmm. It doesn't stay AAKG. That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> One other point. We also did a research project at uh, USF that didn't get published on ALS mice. And it was actually in conjunction with a doctor at the Weizmann Institute who now teaches at a medical school in Israel, Angela Rubin. And the whole idea was the fact that when glutamate exits the cell, because it's so dangerous to the other cells, how can you get rid of it? Well, she and I said, if we use acetoacetate and glutamate oxalate transaminase, and we convert glutamate to glutamine, it's secreted by the kidneys. So if via using oxaloacetate and GOT, right. we can lower the threshold of glutamate in the blood, then by osmosis, it'll automatically just drain into the blood and we can get rid of the glutamate that's in the brain into the, goes into lymphatics, into circulation. We, the problem with that is we have not been able to find glutamate oxaloacetate transaminase for human consumption. Shocking. Let me ask you, Dr. Tatone, we're talking a lot about cellular energy here. First of all, I'm going to, part A of my question, what is it that causes a cell to lose energy to begin with? But then secondly, of course, the pragmatic side of that question is what can we do to stop that from happening? There has been almost no research on why the cell produces abnormal products, as we mentioned before, the proteins, enzymes, gene mutations. I opine that the cell is losing energy, and that's why it produces the abnormal products. 
the Borrelia bacteria to live utilizes glycolysis, the breakdown of sugar. Mm -hmm. When it reproduces, it doesn't have enough energy on its own. So it co-ops the cell's tricarboxylic acid cycle, TCA cycle. And when so doing, it removes energy from the cell. When energy is reduced in the cell, then the cell doesn't function correctly. It produces abnormal products. What else? Now, Borrelia does that. Borrelia is in the genus Spirochete, which is also the same genus as Treponema pallidum, which is syphilis. There are retroviruses that can also take energy from the cell. There are toxins that can take energy from the cell. There are probably fungi and protozoa. We don't really have a lot of information here. What we know is the cell's losing energy. Now, it may be a combination of all those. You know, it may be that the toxins suppress the immune system enough so Borrelia can now flourish and enters the cells and starts to take energy. It may be a combo. Or as people get old, their immune system doesn't function. Why do old people get Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and MS to some degree, okay? Why doesn't everybody get it? I opine that these people are colonized, asymptomatic. The body has been in contact with these bacteria. And the immune system is keeping these bacteria under control. Until one day it just can't. Until something else happens. And, you know, right now we're seeing with COVID, a lot of people have, well, they get COVID, but then they have symptoms lasting a long time. We talked about this offline, and one of the, one of the postulations here is that throughout somebody's ordeal with COVID, if you will, and that is it's almost as if you can't fight two fires at the same time, that your body's able to keep this infection at bay, but then you introduce something as strong as COVID, the immune system races to the new fire, if you will, and then all of these, what we look at as side effects of COVID, are actually dormant uh, disease states or, or dormant bacteria or whatever. Pathogens, dormant bad bacteria that, that have, now flourish. Right, they've been alive in the system. They've just been held at bay by your immune system. And now because we threw a distraction in, the immune system takes part of its resources, moves it to the new infection, and then these are able to dominate, um, which is why we see a lot of just, I, I would say, again, from a standpoint of postulation, we're looking at potentially it's just releasing what already existed. And it's not a side effect at all. It's something that existed prior. You know, in, in looking at the idea of a body attacking itself, an autoimmune, we have to understand that the human body is 43% human cells. The rest of the body is the microbiome, which is good bacteria, bad bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoa, bacteriophages, retroviruses, who knows what. And what amazes me is, you know, the Deanna Protocol, I call it the metabolic key, because it's actually what the body needs, it's actually what the body produced to maintain its functioning. Mm -hmm. It's not something abnormal or unnatural. Well, to that point, you're, you're talking about the Deanna protocol is actually made of all of the, the ingredients are things that naturally exist in the human body. Exactly. You're just supplementing quantities back into the body that the body's incapable of producing on its own. Exactly. Now. With the idea of this microbiome, 
and understand that the symbiotic bacteria produce chemicals that we need for our biochemistry and our physiology, meaning our human cells. We need that. We live, that's necessary. If you add a foreign chemical, a pharmaceutical, the body doesn't know about it. It's never been in the body. To treat a symptom, we don't have the faintest idea of what that does to our microbiome, to the good bacteria. We don't know how they'll react to that. Okay, and that's why when we look at TV and we see a drug it's that's a advertised, then you see two pages of adverse reactions. Well, and I'll, I'll speak to that as well and say that we're looking at protein function and abnormal protein function. And of the likely one million different types of proteins that exist in the body, we've only named about 5% of them. So when we see all these side effects existing, it's because we've created a pharmaceutical to trigger one particular protein or one group of proteins. We don't know how it's going to affect the other 95%. And again, we, we call it a, a it's, it's like taking a hand at a, at a circuit board. You meant to hit one button, but you hit 17. <laughs> it's like guacamole, playing guacamole. You know, you hit mm -hmm. it down here, it pops up there. So Yeah, it's, yeah so and, I mean, uh, similarly, I, I think that's what we're talking about as well, is the same thing happens in the microbiome, and that is we don't know what kind of effects it has, which is why I personally I believe, and I believe a lot of our own subscribers believe, that reintroducing things to the body that are natural to the body we know how the body reacts to those because they exist there already. These aren't, these aren't foreign transplants into the body. These aren't synthetics in the body. They're all naturally existing within the body. And again, all we're doing is, is leveling the quantities that should be in the body. And you speak to the body being an amazing organism. It is. And we need to just keep the body in, a, in an environment and provide it with what it needs to do what it knows how to do already. Going along with those lines, and this has huge implications, um, and obviously I've given a lot of thought to this. Uh, why do genes mutate? We don't even know which genes are active. We don't know if when you methylate a gene, it becomes active. Well, you demethylate a gene, it becomes active. We don't have the answers to that. So we look at genes, and now we're doing CRISPRs and SNPs and all these things. It's almost like if you have a hammer, everything is a nail. I use that phrase way too often. <laughs> so I, I have a big problem with that, and now my thoughts are that the gene mutations occur because cells lack energy. Hmm. And there is research that shows that in prostate cancer, beryllia is present. In breast cancer, beryllia is present. In lymphoma, beryllia is present. Interesting. So we've talked about the Deanna protocol, we've talked about the bacterial infection, the Borrelia that needs to be treated with, you know, pulse antibiotics. But you mentioned to me that there was a third prong that we need to consider here as well. Can you explain that in more depth? Yeah, well, the third prong is, is actually a herbal treatment program. Um, when the patient is infected by the vector, we don't know what other pathogens the vector carried. So it's a shotgun approach to treat anything that's there that we cannot detect and we don't know about. And I've been using the Cowden Support Program, which is a herbal treatment program. And that's the third prong of the approach to treating the neurodegenerative diseases. If it's ALS, because it's rapid, we use intravenous. For the other diseases, because they're not as rapid, you can use an oral route. And this is all explained on the Winning the Fight website. 
And that's at winningthefight.org. Correct. For people to find additional information on that. The WFND, Winning the Fight of neuro, Against Neurodegenerative Diseases, excuse me, is the acronym. Right. So one of the questions that gets asked a lot in this nutritional supplement space is, is this FDA approved? What would you, what would you say to that? So it is a nutritional supplement. And the FDA does not really regulate nutritional supplements. Right. So as a nutritional supplement, I can honestly say the FDA doesn't actually regulate, regulate supplementation. Correct. And because of that, the Adana Protocol is not FDA approved because it doesn't require FDA approval. Correct. So if we're talking about nutritional supplements here, we're talking about bacterial, we're talking about all of these different things that should be taking place, but I would be remiss in not asking you specifically, what about just a person's everyday diet? I mean, what kind of diet would you recommend to a person who is, uh, who is starting this treatment but dealing with ALS in general? I would recommend two things. I would recommend enhancing your immune system. All right, you can Google the immune system online and there are various things that uh, they offer. And a healthy diet. No, uh, staying away from processed foods. Um, you know, I myself, I eat grass-fed beef. Um, vegetables, salads, um, and just a healthy diet in general. So the definition of healthy diet, I think, changes from person to person because everybody has their opinion of that. You know, we hear all about ketogenic diets and there's other people who are vegan, which is the exact opposite of that, it would seem. Um, but from the standpoint of the way that a bacteria would feed on sugar, as we talked earlier, that, that sugar really, I mean, it's toxic in so many ways for so many reasons, but this bacteria would feed on sugar, and we talked about a ketogenic diet as being a, an appropriate way for an ALS patient to, to eat. Why would that be specifically? When it's sugar, you, uh, the bacteria need sugar to flourish. And, and sugar not just coming in the form of raw sugar, white sugar as we know it, but sugar meaning that well, know, complex carbohydrates are going to absolute, break down into glucose well, and be stored. You know, there are carbohydrates and there are carbohydrates. Okay, um, you know, the uh, fructose and that you often find is another name for it. You're probably, that's just skipping my, uh, my memory now. There's another, Sucrose, fructose. You yeah, but so there's many. another name for the fructose that's often used uh, as a sweetener, and I can't think of the name of it. But you want to stay away from all all Aspartame. those products, and you want to stay away from um, uh, all the sugar substitutes because you don't know how those chemicals will affect the good bacteria in your body. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you probably want to, fermented foods are very good because they support your good microbiome. Mm -hmm. um, so fermented foods, you're recommending things like sauerkraut. Sauerkraut, yogurt, yes. Yogurt, beets, yes, that type yes, of thing. Yes, yes, yes. And um, just stay away from fast foods, processed foods. I think that's good advice in general. Yes. <laughs> And the last one you have here is finding a doctor. What are you thinking on that? Like, how would you find a person? I think the best thing I would recommend is telling people to go to a Lyme literate doctor, I believe is the phrase we use most often on the websites, that if a person is wondering about if, if this stuff doesn't contradict. Um, there is a website, Iliad, I-L-A-D-S, and supposedly these doctors have taken a course on Lyme disease. Well, since Lyme disease causes Borrelia, and Borrelia causes ALS, they should be helpful with ALS. I, I'm not sure you're going to find the doctor that you need. Um, I think the grapevine and, you know, social media, there are websites for Lyme disease that you can go to, um, 
And so, and what happens with people when they receive these diagnoses is they go to their their normal doctor. They go to the person who they speak to most often, where they have this comfort level with this person, and that. And unfortunately, what happens is these types of very, very specific treatments for very specific diseases. That's not the specialty of that doctor. That doctor doesn't know all of the ins and outs like we're discussing. Right. He refers them to a neurologist. It, correct. And so most neurologists don't know any of what I've discussed. Right. So, so the general practitioner or the, or the internal medicine doctor refers them to a neurologist because this is classified as a neurodegenerative disease. The neurologist is not used to treating these types of things because as we've discussed, this is an infectious disease. And from the, that perspective... The neurologist will treat their symptoms fair. with chemicals, won't treat the cause. If you have ALS, they tell you, go home and die. And so the idea is that we need to get people, sooner is better, to find a Lyme literate doctor. And we use that phrase Lyme literate simply because Lyme disease is probably the most commonly known disease in the, in the Borrelia family of diseases that exactly. it causes. Exactly, exactly. So a, a Lyme literate doctor, find a doctor who treats Lyme disease and, and let that person be your inroad into this bacterial treatment. Now from that, from, from that direction, what I would say is like now we're going to get the person into the Lyme doctor. And if they're looking for a Lyme doctor, often what we find is get on social media groups that support this type thing, as you're saying. Um, go to the winningthefight.org website. We reach out to, to the Deanna Protocol. But we can give you recommendations of doctors that can actually help treat in your area if we know somebody in the area, or if nothing else, put you in contact with a doctor not in your area who may know somebody. But the idea is that we need a specialist in this, this space. It's very hard to find. It really is. I have difficulty finding them. Right. And it's expensive. But it's, but it's not hopeless. Um, it's, no, it's not hopeless. And what the key here is, the key here really is, we need to get the word out that these diseases are caused by infections. Mm -hmm. We need to detect the infection, and then we need to treat it. That's the key. Well, Dr. Donna, I have to tell you that speaking to you and speaking to your family is an inspiration, to be honest with you, because when, when we hear stories of you know people who are swimming upstream in the medical community, if you will, it takes a, it takes a lot of courage to, to be the antithesis of commonly held medical advice. And, and you're bringing this to the world, and I agree with you, we need to get this message out so that people can hear more of it. Um, but yours and Deanna's courage, and your whole family for that matter, to, to stand up to the medical community in this respect, not defiantly, but collaboratively. If getting this message out, if it can bring an adequate response where people will fund research through WFND. Money talks. If I have enough funds, I can go to these people and say, this is what we need to do. And if enough research gets out there, people are going to have to recognize that these diseases, by the way, all neurodegenerative diseases are called autoimmune diseases. All of them. Okay. Autism is an autoimmune disease. Okay. Even some psychiatric illnesses are autoimmune diseases. They're not. They're not. It's a cop-out in a medical community. They can't find out what causes it, so... You know, and I, th I think what happens in the medical community is we can only teach what we know, what we know and, and we're trained in this one uh, vein of thinking, and, and getting outside of that seems very counterintuitive to many people. Yeah, if we can start at the beginning of why the cell does that, right. determine what that cause is, okay. Um, and it doesn't discount the knowledge of the medical community. It no. just it puts additional chairs at the table. Exactly. So that we can all have a conversation about well, why treat the symptom and let the disease continue to progress. And isn't that the point of science? Is continuous research and development? Yeah. Yeah.